and then environmental uh, methods. To continue uh, with the types of zoonosis, why I'm coming back to this is, now whenever we talk of a parasite, we always focus our attention to a life cycle. And the life cycle, although it's difficult to study and understand, but it is essential because that is the way of propagation of, of these various parasites and transmission. Orthozoonosis is a direct method uh, wherein uh, the uh, parasites are transmitted. Here again, coming back to what I said earlier, direct contact, fomites, and mechanical vectors. It could be perpetuated in nature by a single vertebrate species. For example, Kenya solium is the best example. It's a very old parasite, well known in medical history uh, since uh, biblical times. Uh, but then it's still there in the in spite of being in the 21st century it's still there and the reasons are many uh, man acts as the main host here uh, although the pig is blamed because man is the natural uh, definitive host he can also act as intermediate host he transmits the disease through passing the segments gravid segments and the feces contaminating the environment and the way of farming is so uh, not yet completely fine with regard to pigs. Pigs, uh, these uh, pigs which are there in the um, uh, free range system of rearing have access to feces and fecal disposal and uh, management is a big problem as we all know. Cyclozoonosis is a type wherein more than one vertebrate species uh, is involved. A good example here again would be Kenya species, Sagineta and Solium but I would like to draw your attention to cystic echinococcosis because this dog tapeworm echinococcus granulosis contaminates the environment and all the gray, all the food animals can become intermediate hosts, mainly sheep and all the others like cattle, it could be horse, it could be pigs and man gets accident, accidentally involved. Metazoonosis here, is a, there's a requirement for vertebrates and invertebrates to complete the transmission. Here I'm giving you three examples of diseases, uh, mainly associated with parasites. Now here in our own state of Karnataka, we have clearly transmitted thing because actually it was there in the forest, maintained by the ticks in the forest with monkeys. But when man encroached into the uh, uh, forest for uh, bringing in uh, things, uh, they got infected and became a host. And it's still there in some parts of our state. Sometimes it is, uh, it's an endemic disease, we can see. Then we have bacterial diseases which are flea bone. For example, plague. Although it's an old disease, there are some eruptions of you know, in the prevalence of this disease here and there, which causes alarm. Parasitic diseases, for example, slain, uh, sl snail bone loops are a good example for this. In metazoonosis, we have, have all the invertebrate hosts uh, and uh, for example perpetuate in nature transmit many important zoonotic diseases. Saprozoonosis, both vertebrate host and non-animal uh, developmental site is a virus involved. Organic material like food, soil, plants are the methods of transmission. Good examples would be larval, mi larval migrants when in the dog, uh, tapeworm, um, roundworm, toxicara, eggs are in the environment, they're very hardy, they persist there. People who go to the ground, uh, those who play in the ground, the children, uh, farmers, etc., get exposed to this and myasis. So these were the different types of zoonosis. Now, I'd like to focus your attention to the major zoonosis which have been identified by the WHO. This was discussed and this is enlisted and they are cystic echinococcosis, zoonotic leishmaniosis, cysticercosis, toxoplasmosis, cryptosporidiosis, which continue to occur and prevail. Now, what are the emerging zoonoses? We have new and resurging zoonotic diseases which have occurred over the past few years, causing global concern. Now, what I would like to say is, in this regard, uh, I, my attention was drawn to the occurrence of Lyme's disease which is by a spirochete borrelia. Um, uh, here, what happened is this is tick bone. 
it was restricted to North America and some other countries there, but now we have it in India. How did it come? It could be due to increased travel, trade, contamination, and spread of this disease through the vectors which have come and established here. And one more important thing is vector borne infections have become very common now due to climate change. There is uh, the, the reason is the vectors which are supposed to prevail during a particular season are now in a confusion because the seasons are not consistent. Therefore, this is one of the scourges of the day. What are the risk factors? In the beginning, I said that companion animals are one of the important ways. And here we have dogs and roundworm. Uh, roundworm is very common among dogs, Bactocara, Octoplasma and cats. We have a lot of both domestic and stray cats which spread this and uh, it does in developing, uh, developing countries, it's in developed countries as well. An example here I've put up is in U UK, there are 22.56 million households wherein 50% of them own uh, dog uh, and ca cats. Occupational hazards, just like how occupational hazards are there for viruses and bacteria or parasites we have, animal control workers have a, a great risk, wildlife biologists and farmers. Farmers, what I would like to say is just recently in, in the news we have a farmer who had uh, COVID and now his uh, sheep and goats are being tested whether they can transmit. So this is just an incidental example, you don't know what it is, but here farmers get vulnerable, sheep, uh, shepherds, for example, they're so closely associated with sheep, Easter service, the nasal gods are very common. Uh, so when these uh, farmers, uh, shepherds sleep with these sheep and live with them, there is every chance of a larva going into their eyes and causing ophthalmo um, myasis. Food bone, raw meat, vegetable sources, unpasteurized milk are some other sources. Now recreational activities play an important role, camping, hunting, for example, even hunting, people, what they do, they go and hunt and they usually stay there, they camp there, they roast the meat, the animal and eat it up there, not knowing how much of a disease they could gain from wild boars and so on. Farm settings, cattle and cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium is difficult to detect, sometimes it's missed. Uh, calves are very vulnerable and uh, some of the species of cryptosporidium are uh, zoonotic in nature. Travel. People who travel from countries which don't have malaria into endemic places uh, acquire malaria. Now, I have just told you about uh, the various uh, nasooculomyasis in shepherds. Hydatidosis is one more common thing. Trypanosomosis in hunters, cutaneous leishmaniosis, schistomosis. For example, swim swimmers itch, circadial dermatitis in paddy field workers and clam diggers. Another example. Now here, our attention needs to also be drawn that immunocompromised patients uh, uh, with HIV, transplant individuals, cancer patients are very vulnerable and they get badly affected with clinical disease with cryptosporidiosis which can cause a life-threatening uh, diarrhea, malaria and toxoplasmosis which causes the cerebral form in these patients because they are immunosuppressed. Therefore, usually it's advised that these patients be kept away from pets and so on, so that they don't acquire these infections. Then, the emerging and re-emerging infections, I'll bring two examples here. Neurocysticercosis continues to be an emerging and re-emerging problem, and there are many hemoprotozoa which are coming to the limelight, which are not there. Now, I'll just run through um, the factors prevailing, influencing the prevalence of zoonosis. Ecological considerations play a very important role. When there is development being done through dam construction or irrigation, what happens is water moves from one area containing certain uh, vectors and intermediate hosts like snails are uh, uh, spread from one place far away to another place. So along with that, we have the risk of schistosomosis, trypanosomosis, paragonimiosis, and tachyphysis, mainly snail bone infections. The effect of human settlement, uh, now we all know that along with human beings, we have uh, certain uh, what, uh, certain animals which are always there uh, around the households like rats, mice, bats, birds and lizards, companion animals, food producing animals, 
wild and semi wild animals then the next is fluctuation in animal population density which i uh, told you earlier this example is an outbreak of cystic fibrosis among cattle in usa transmitted by a single carrier of tinea saginata this worker was having the state form in his intestine passing the segments into the feces and uh, i mean it was spreading and uh, uh, what happened is all the cattle in that farm they when this uh, sewage uh, was uh, used for this uh, pastures uh, the cattle which grazed there picked up this infection and all had cysts in the muscle, uh, in the beef sarcoptic mange in cattle was transmitted by a single farm worker now one very important method of zoonosis which all need to understand is any deviation in human behavior and habits is one of the very important factor which influencing zoonosis for example sexually transmitted diseases normal behavior there or it could be even homosexuality and food habits wherein the parasite of infective stages in the food for example tinea and fish bone tetrametodes parasite from the environment the soil water animal from food handlers uh, which uh, may, makes it possible to get echinococcosis fasciolosis ascariosis and dicroceriosis environmental pollution uh, by fecal contamination water soil vegetation irrigation of pasture with sewage to affluent the food borne parasites can be grouped into two categories those which spread naturally in food through meat fish mollusks and crustacea for example some crustacean um, products are used raw in salads and then mollusks are eaten raw sometimes fish and meat if not properly cooked all this could lead to tinea nematobatrium fishbone trematodes and then trichinella and various other nematode parasites including toxoplasma sarcosis and the tangworm lingotoda and then parasites that are derived from <coughs> um, the environment that is the soil water from animals or food handlers and whose infective stages occur as contaminants in food like echinococcus faciola and various other examples now here i have given a long list i will not read it out just to make you and make draw your attention to the fact that there are 24 flukes which as of now have been identified as zoon with zoonotic potential they could be intestinal flukes could be lung flukes liver flukes uh, ur urinary bladder flukes and uh, then uh, others like eventus soms which cause circulatory dermatitis and various other types of flukes there are 13 tapeworms which have been identified as uh, with zoonotic potential just a one or two at, uh, to draw your attention spirometra can come in when people have certain fun, uh, various uh, methods like using the skin of frog, infected frogs apply it as by poultices to wounds especially the eye and so on then we have another example there are so many other examples of tapeworms which can be transmitted through various animals and then here i'd like to say that one important thing which many may not know there is a subspecies of tinea saginata which has evolved in asia it was identified in korea taiwan was called the taiwan tinea then in philippines korea and now it was identified in india we in bangalore have the credit that one of the phd students uh, worked on this and found that tinea saginata asiatica is there in uh, our slaughterhouses here a new uh, by a zoonotic parasite Uh, which uh, occurs in the liver of pigs and uh, the intestine of man the adult tapeworm is found these are 48 nematode species so a long list there and then we have 29 protista which could be uh, now here again i just went one or two examples trypanosome avanzi a very common endemic parasite blood parasite which is found in uh, camels horses cattle and buffaloes there have been reports in india and a few reports in india and abroad that this species has been identified in man it actually is not a human parasite so it's evolving emerging so we need to be cautious about it and then we have number of species of cryptosporidia uh, more each day due to molecular methods more and more species are being identified some of them have zoonotic potential and then we have the other species listed there two of the species of thorny headed worms and 10 arthropods here i like to say that fleas uh, which are uh, commonly found in dogs and cats can now uh, are now known to attack all other uh, species of 
animal and man histo service i have already told you about the importance of it it's quite common among eye patients gastrophilus causes creeping eruptions when it enters the skin of man so these were a list of number of parasites which have zoonotic potential going closer to my the end i like to just say uh, there are uh, these are the general control measures against parasitic uh, uh, infections which are of zoonotic importance proper cooking and eating habits to control food borne zoonosis what do we mean by proper cooking for example it has been proved that uh, in meat containing uh, measly pork measly beef two uh, things which uh, if not properly cooked it can lead to tear bones in the intestine of man but if it's cooked properly it can uh, the cyst can be killed one of the best methods of control is by uh, pressure cooking and then freezing these two temperature these two temperatures high and low they uh, control and kill the parasites and it can curtail the disease and eating habits have to be very important about for example it can be through vegetable sources also so proper cooking proper treatment for example meat and fish should be properly cooked and preserved vegetables when used raw require proper washing now here we are very vulnerable because there are many raw vegetables that are used daily as a health a uh, measure uh, like carrots and various other um, soil grown vegetables like radish and so on what they do is uh, they are uh, they uh, are grown in the soil uh, in the soil and so many of times due to lack of water the farmers they wash them with the sewage water uh, the contaminated water so this if it's not properly washed uh, it can uh, cause an infection easily many of the people of econ- who are economically sound have had cases of cystic fibrosis they are pure vegetarians but they got it the way of getting it was see these vegetables if just by uh, regular washing the eggs are very sticky they don't get washed off it has to be removed and or either ways they have to be washed properly and scalded it with the uh, hot water if not cooked properly and or chemical treatment methods like using salt water and so on vector control methods are one more important method of curtailing zoonotic infections which are vector borne there are many methods not easy to do um, chemical biological or physical or an integrated pest management method has to be followed in spite of all that we are still clear and not completely sound with vector control methods we are trying and it's going on and on now there are certain specific drugs which can uh, treat uh, important diseases we are very fortunate that very recently i think around 10 years ago oxfentazole was introduced in india and this drug is very specific a single dose of oxfentazole to an infected pig with cystic fibrosis completely kills the cyst and within a 3 months the cysts are completely gone from the pig and the pig is safe for slaughter and consumption so it's a promising drug and then antisystodal drugs for dogs like prazcontrol and so on have to be given so that echinococcus Uh, can be completely uh, I mean, eliminated now there are a few vaccines for important zoonotic parasites like coxovax for cat for toxoplasma gondii cystivax which is available in india now for pigs for cystisarcosis gaiadi vax cryptosporidil vaccine for dogs and cats and so on but we need to know the economics and how to, i mean how to go about it so another important thing which i'd like to underline is proper behavior and hygienic habits this will in a very weak uh, one of the best methods uh, if we is properly educated by by extension methods both medical and uh, uh, veterinary public health workers that proper behavior any improper behavior can cause uh, deviation hygienic habits so here we are now coming to understand the importance of distancing in this present time so here behavior becomes important uh, for example people Uh, now are being fined for spitting spitting has been rampant uh, very rampant very freely to spit anywhere and to waste disposal uh, etc have been very important methods uh, common uh, factors which have propagated many diseases and then we have sanitation which has to be improved this is one of the biggest problems in developing countries waste disposal and sewage treatment in this regard i'd like to say that these initiatives which are being taken up by the governments at the of the time regarding the next swachh bharat and so on are improving the toilet facilities and they it is claimed that it's defecation free but defecation 
token application continue in many places, which if controlled can, meet, uh, can help in controlling many with these problems. Now, uh, in this regard, uh, we now have realized in the more recent times of the importance of the One Health concept, which involves a greater degree of integration of human and animal health resources. Previously, we were in isolation. Medical was a separate and animal health was separate. But now, integration of this is very important because unless we both get together, we cannot control important diseases, especially uh, fatal diseases like rabies and various other important diseases, bacterial and parasitic diseases. So once we get together, zoonosis can be better surveyed, diagnosed and controlled by considering human and animal health together. We have all come to understand how important that our animal health labs are with regard to diagnostic facilities for important diseases and um, therefore we need to get together. It would also ensure better access to health inputs for poor people and recognize the needs of the livestock and encourage cost sharing in proportion to benefits gained by each sector could be an enabling component of the One Health approach. I am very thankful once again for all of you who are patiently heard and I also thank the veterinary college Hassan and the other staff and the dean and all uh, university officials for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. So, okay. So that yes. was an excellent and highly informative spellbinding pro presentation on an overview on parasitic diseases of zoonotic importance by Professor Placid, sir. Uh, just to summarize, in his uh, brief talk, sir spoke on the classification of zoonosis with classical examples of parasitic diseases. And he also talked about uh, the emerging and uh, re-emerging diseases with particular uh, reference to neurosystem psychosis, factors uh, influencing zoonosis, ecology role, and the human settlement and the human behavior influencing zoonosis, examples, and common control measures and treatment modalities. Uh, modalities. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, for this uh, beautiful presentation, highly informative presentation. Now the uh, the session is open for the discussion. Um, before that, you know, people, uh, uh, two, three uh, uh, participants have sent their uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, just a second, just a second, please, please hold on. Uh, Dr. Rakesh K. R. Patra, if you are listening, please unmute yourself and you can ask your question directly to Placid sir. Dr. Rakesh K. R. Patra, if you are listening, please unmute and talk to Placid sir directly. Rakesh K. R. Patra. Yes, sir. You can talk yes, to Placid sir. Yes. We can hear you, please. Uh, I said that uh, any genetic disease, there is any genetic disease that transmitted from the uh, aquarium fishes to the human uh, during the handling the uh, home aquarium. Hello, sir. His question is actually has typed this uh, question. Is I'm any zoonotic disease? Uh, I'm seeing okay, the question. Please. Can we call COVID 19 as zoonotic potential? As we thought, it is transmitted from bat. Is that right? So this question, what I would say is, the, this is, and I will not answer this, in the sense that COVID-19 is a very peculiar, very complicated problem. Nobody has understood it fully. And in that regard, zoonotic, in the initial stages, we came to understand that some lions and tigers tested positive. And then, now, right now, we have this in the news. There is any other question shepherd, from me. What is the actual difference uh, between metagenosis and... Uh, no, Rakesh, Rakesh, just, just a second. Hello, hello, Rakesh, please. No, he's answering, uh, sir is answering your second question. Yes, sir. Okay, he's answering your second question. After that, you'll come to the first question. Please listen to this request, okay? Yes, sir, please. Sure. Regarding COVID, we leave it as that. It is, has to be proved. It's not yet proved, so let us not commit whether it's a zoonosis. What is the next question? Hello? Yes. 
sir actually yes has another question actually that was the first question is any zoonotic disease transmitted yes. from aquarium fish to human during handling which happens in the home condition no aquarium fishes no 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 aquarium fish they are very safe as i can understand and uh, the fish bone zoonosis is mainly from sea water and river water fish these aquarium fish as such i have i have not come across any report of it being unsafe or zoonotic is it okay okay thank you sir so yes i have rakesh uh, patro yes i have another question uh, what is the actual difference between metagenosis and zoonosis that is tell me Sir, sir, we have another question from Shailesh Yadav. So, please introduce yourself if you can unmute and talk and talk to us, sir, directly. Shailesh Yadav. Hello, sir. Unmute and talk, sir. If please introduce yourself in one or two sentences. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, yes, hello. Sir, this is Shailesh. I am uh, alumni student, sir, from Assam Veterinary College. Yes. Sir, uh, my question is: In peel condition, is Bagmil effective against ticks? Can we use that at longer doses, high, higher doses? Bedenil for trips trypanosomas. Yes, it is a sanative drug. Actually, bedenil is not the drug of choice. Ah, sir. Uh, but when you <laughs> don't have quin pyramin pyramin salts, ah, ah, sir. When they are not available, then it, you can go in for bedenil. Ah, 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 sir. But we have to take it uh, at higher doses now, sir. No, 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 no. Doses will be the same. No higher ah, doses. The dose ah. of bedenil, as per Recommendation for each animal species has to be followed. Okay. Okay, okay sir. Yeah. And one more question, sir. Yes. And it's all uh, again related to COVID-19 patients. Can I ask it? Like anti-malarial drug, uh, does it have any effect on COVID-19 patients? Anti-malarial drugs. See, initially they have tried all sorts of drugs, including anti-malarial drug. Ah, sir. Hydroxychloroquine. Uh huh. But what I understand from reading and knowing is that this doesn't have an effect on the patient. Ah, sir. Uh, on a patient who is infected, it is uh -huh. given to people as a prophylactic. Prophylactic measure. Okay. That's all. Uh -huh. That is okay. how Donald Trump had taken this as a course. Uh -huh. Prophylactic. Okay. Oh, uh, okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to answer this, uh, which is here in this chat box. Uh, Shashank S, is he there? Uh, hello, sir. Shashank says neurocystisocosis can be cured by albendazole. Uh, yes, the albendazole and praziquantel are drugs of choice for neurocystisocosis patients and human beings. But the dosage and the treatment is not um, like given for other worms. It is a long-term uh, treatment. At a high dose. That is what is being given right now in uh, Nimans and all the hospitals where patients have been uh, found. Is it okay, Shashank? Yes, Anybody else? Well, question from my side, sir. Girish from yes, Hassan. Yes. So why is uh, why it's not possible for uh, developing vaccines for many of these conditions? We have only few vaccines for the parasitic disease, uh, including proto protozoan diseases. Uh, hmm. So what is hampering? So why we are unable to develop vaccine, effective vaccines for controlling most of these uh, parasitic diseases? In spite of many constraints in developing a disease for parasitic 
I mean, uh, a vaccine for parasitic disease. Strides have been made, the uh, targets have been discovered, potential ones are there. They are not economically viable. For example, uh, if they produce a vaccine, how many people will buy them and use them? That is the question. So, when a disease is rampant, for example, Tyleria annulata, bovine tropical tyleriosis, was very common at one time in India. At that time, a vaccine was produced, it was found effective, it is still being used. So, like that, we have few vaccines. You know, for example, Cystivax has been patented and it has been um, it's being marketed in Indian immunologicals in Hyderabad for cystisocosis and pigs. But how many people will use them? So, that is the problem. Economic viability, government will support. The government has to support. Otherwise, they are very costly. Production is a cost uh, the, for problem. That is why we have a vaccine, few vaccines for parasitic disease. Is it okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Anybody else? Sir. Yes. Major, majority of vaccines for only viral diseases, sir. Yes. Hello. Yes. Sir, why not for other other uh, microbes, sir? No, that's what I'm telling you. When viral diseases cause a lot of morbidity and mortality, they are identified and vaccines are produced and they are used. Same thing for bacteria also, common diseases. So, for everything and anything, a vaccine cannot be produced. If drugs are there, preventive measures are there, they are the best. For example, foot and mouth. Do zoonotic diseases get it? No, it's not restricted to only zoonotic diseases. It can be any bacterial disease. Okay, where it is overused and abused, mainly, if you want me yes. to tell. It could be for a, a microbe, it could be for parasitic also. Anthelmintic resistance is common now. And, yes. and a caricycle resistance is common now. It is when it is misused, abused, that is then that is when it happens. Yes. Okay. Good evening, sir. Yes, good evening. Hello. Sir, can you tell something about anti helminthic resistance, sir, in animals? Yes, anti helminthic resistance is a big problem in sheep. It is very rampant throughout the world. It's very common in India also. So a lot of steps are being taken. Here again, it's due to improper dosage, overdosage, and wrong dosage. So there are simple steps which can avoid this. One is not using it when when it's uh, unnecessarily dosing animals is not required. Then there are few worms, no need to dose. And when there are worms, only three doses per year are recommended. So there are some strict measures now. So that is helping to overcome this problem. Is it okay? Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, good evening, sir. I am Dr. Sujata Singh. Good evening. Hello. Yeah, good evening, sir. I am Dr. Sujata Singh from uh, yes. TVMR. Yeah. Uh, sir, just I want to ask you, is, is there any zero surveillance will be there for the echinococcus in intermediate host? Which will be the best of it, sir? No, it's, uh, see, we need not do that. For example, in our research studies, we can yeah, yeah. do uh, Regularly, we don't do it. And one more thing what I would like to say is, in food mm -hmm. animal, usually echinococcus is detected only on post-mortem or slaughter. Yes, it doesn't yes, manifest yes. as a clinical condition. Yes. Okay, but in humans, it's yes. very important as zoonosis. If it affects the liver, it can cause serious yes. uh, illness. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we have done many studies. There are simple tests. There are higher tests. Proper PCR is there. PCR is there. ELISA is there. So many tests are there. It can be done. But only on the basis of humans only, is it? Not the intermediate. Animals can, it can, be, can be done in animals. Yes. Sir. Okay, immunodiagnosis, molecular diagnosis is available. Okay. Lots yes. of reports are there, lot of papers are there. We have done a yes. lot of work in Bangalore, in the veterinary college also. 
in no diagnosis which is best suited to for example from a simple test like immunodiffusion latex agglutination is one promising test very simple rapid easy to do elisa which can be indirect okay. elisa okay so these yeah. are some so tests which have been standardized thank you sir okay good evening sir good evening so my name is vinay i am from bangalore yeah sir uh, for parasitic uh, uh, diseases uh, what vaccine would you uh, recommend for a place like bangalore sir for pets for pets there are no vaccines available in india for that matter for dogs and cats you think yes sir no there are no so you see for dogs and cats the main things which are proper feeding and maintenance and deworming deworming takes care of it for example even in developed countries they took a uh, to curtail echinacea courses it's praziquanta which is given now it's available in india dosing with praziquanta so deworming can be done with any of the broad spectrum uh, and uh, and telemedics okay so there are no vaccines it's mainly deworms okay sir thank you yeah so this is going to be the last question sir one student has asked this question parasitic diseases are highly neglected in field conditions as a veterinarian how we should bring the solution is there a solution for this yes there is uh, what i would ask uh, no this i always always stress in all the training programs and lectures wherever i have given see as a field veterinarian it is very important you are the one who can spread the knowledge in all the fora in your meetings and also you have so many uh, dosing programs and field health, health health camps there you have to disseminate knowledge see here extension plays a very important role more than anything else and many farmers are poor, very uh, i mean the progressive farmers know something but the uh, the farmers who are not very literate need to be educated on this it's very important eating habits breeding maintenance and even um, uh, all the other habits i mean uh, disposal of waste manure so extension plays an important role so i would i ask you wherever possible whenever possible as a field veterinarian you need to take this up and propagate this that is the only main way and now the technology is there just like how we have a webinar now you can do it through various meetings you know previously they used to have this regularly in the uh, in the field conditions showing a film uh, now the tv is there uh, you know the krishi darshan program so many uh, so actually i did one program on tyleriosis once in uh, doordarshan the num my number was there and farmers i thought i'm only a parasitologist farmers kept calling me off and on for all the problems this just showed how desperate they are they don't know many things ranging from mastitis to retention of placenta to so many things they called me up. so i can only just give them a guidance and ask them where to go to so what i would like to say is education extension education is one of the most important methods by which a veterinarian can play a role and also coordinate with medical people medical people very like in the beginning i told you know very less on parasitic diseases especially so they depend on us a veterinarian is fully equipped to give that knowledge so i think this uh, is what i'd like to say so thank you very much sir with this we'll come to the the conclusion of uh, the first webinar of our series so thank you very much sir once again for enlightening us with uh, a lot of uh, information and field oriented uh, knowledge transfer on parasitic zoonosis on behalf of uh, veterinary college hasan and on on behalf of karnataka veterinary animal and fishery sciences university from the students and the teachers we uh, wholeheartedly thank you for being with us and also for presenting this very informative uh, webinar on parasitic zoonosis sir thank you very much sir thank you very I'm much very... all the participants okay thank you very much from my side okay sir thank you sir